Hi friend, this is Alex McRobbs, founder of The Mindful Life Practice, and you're listening to the Sober Yoga Girl podcast. I'm a Canadian who moved across the world to the Middle East at age 23, and I never went back. I got sober in 2019, and I now live full-time in Bali, Indonesia. I've made it my mission to help other women around the world stop drinking, start yoga, and change their lives through my online Sober Girls Yoga community. You're not alone, and a sober life can be fun and fulfilling. Let me show you how. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Sober Yoga Girl. I am really excited to be sitting here today with Carolyn Clark. And Carolyn and I have known each other for about a year, probably. I think around a year ago is when Carolyn became a member of the Mindful Life Practice. And since then, it just feels like I've known you for way longer than a year because we've just con- connected on so many levels. And Carolyn did the 30 hour sober curious yoga teacher training with me. And then she started running circles with the Mindful Life Practice. Then she came to Bali for a retreat that I was the yoga teacher on. And now she's organized her own yoga retreat for next year, which is fully booked. She was just telling me before the podcast episode started, which is just so exciting. And so I'm just excited to hear more about your story and what got you to the point of sobriety and and the work you're doing now. So welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, Alex. It's so good to be here. I was just telling you, Alex, that I've heard most of the episodes of Sober Yoga Girl. And when you invited me, I was like, like, um, really? I was elated. I danced around my lounge. (laughs) My husband was like, what's wrong with you? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so that's that's been inviting me. It's awesome. And I'm really excited to hear your story because Last week, Carolyn was actually the guest speaker for the speaker series, which normally I stay awake for the whole meeting. It's it's at 10 p.m. Bali time. But last week was the middle of my yoga retreat. And I really should have just asked someone else to facilitate. But I was like, I really want to hear Carolyn's story. I'm going to do it. And then I, I said, I'm just going to turn off my camera and rest. And I woke up and I was the only person on this. <laughs> so I didn't hear your story last week. So I, and I thought, you know, it's okay because I'm going to do the podcast with her next week. So I'm going to get to hear it all from her again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't take it personally because you, as you know, Alex, I've been on Zooms where I've woken up and there's just all I hear in, in, in my head is, is Alex saying, I think Carolyn's asleep. <laughs> it's just you there. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. That's too funny. Mm. So I was wondering if you could start us off by telling us a little bit about your life before sobriety, like what, um, kind of what was your journey? Yeah. Um, well, I first discovered alcohol when I was a teen. Um, I'd had some rough times, um, and, I can remember being in a in a friend's like house party, and we must have been about fifteen or something. And I drank alcohol, and I remember it. I didn't have an off switch. It just, and I remember thinking, "Wow, I love this because I'm not like feeling those feelings that I was feeling um, of being somehow other to to the people around me, to the to my friends." Um, you know, there'd been some some trauma um, that that I'd suffered, and I had not told anyone. And I carried this with me and thought I was the only person. And I thought that all my friends, you know, they would they would be, um, yeah. I, I I had carried deep deep shame for the trauma that I had suffered. So so I remember drinking and thinking, wow, this is like a, a real great like off button, you know. Um, so that was then, and I carried on drinking. It, it it never got massively problematic in my teens and my 20s. I was having um, children, but also in my 20s, my, my father, uh, who'd had a serious alcohol problem, he passed away. I was about 22 or 23, um, and he was only 48. 
And I remember thinking at that time, this is just, you know, awful that alcohol um, has been a contributing factor in, in his death. And I wanted to, to do something um, to help others. So at that time, I, I trained as um, a coach, uh, not a coach, a um, counsellor, a therapist, if you like. So um, Carl Rogers, uh, sort of person-centred counselling. So I did that for a little while. I worked with people who had an alcohol problem. Um, really enjoyed doing that. It's something that really lit me up. Um, so studying things like transactional analysis, which was really big in the 90s, you know, Eric Byrne, um, that kind of thing. And, and I really enjoyed that aspect and just working with people one-to-one, -one, the, the close kind of clinical supervision we used to have as well. So it was really a load of self-development stuff happening. But then I started working as a public servant. So kind of all of that, I couldn't fit it all in. So I, I gave up the, the, the alcohol work and sort of, Fast forward really to probably when my children were older, my 40s, um, where I thought mm, I, it was like grey area drinking, right? You know, the, the term that people sort of bandy around was, you know, it was the, the off switch at the end of work, you know? Um, so not necessarily the the hedonism and the, and the going out and the socialising, it became a, sometimes I think it was a, a preference for me. Like, it, you know, if I had the option of going somewhere, um, going out partying or socialising or like just staying at home and opening the bottle, I, I became more aware that I was doing the latter. You know, I just wanted to switch off. Um, so I kind of knew that that was... That was a not a good relationship to have with it at that point, really. So that was in my probably my forties. Um, yeah, and then my fifties. Um, my brother Michael had a problem with alcohol, and he lost his battle with it. Um, he was fifty-two, so. Yeah, that was a that was that really shook me to my core because um, there was a lot of for me guilt around what had happened with him. I didn't understand alcohol use disorder at that point, even though I thought mm, I need to kind of you know tone this down a bit and not not drink as much. I didn't really understand as much as I do now. Um, or perhaps I'd just forgotten a lot of what I knew in the 90s, you know. And Michael had uh, stopped having any contact with the family for the six months before he died. And I was angry with him for that. Um, so rather than be supportive, I don't actually know what I would have done different because he was just refusing to take calls, refusing to allow us to visit him. But, after the six month period, when I did manage to get to see him, I saw how ill he was. And he almost, he looked really relieved to see me. And he was, an ambulance was called. I, I went to hospital with him in, in the ambulance and he said to me, Carolyn, I'm not going back. I'm never going back to this. And I said, no, you're not. You know, we've got you now, we've got you. Um, you're going to be okay, but sadly he wasn't. And five days later, he he lost his life. So that really shook me, and I just did not deal with my feelings very well at all. And I just numbed them. alcohol. Um, so I didn't really process the grief. Sure, I felt sad. I felt sad all of the time. And it's, for me, the only release from that sadness was when I opened a bottle of wine every evening. Um, so that wasn't great. I was going to India then for a month's traveling in 
2019. So before that, at the end of 2018, I thought, well, I need to get fit because I could feel how unfit I was becoming. So I thought, I will stop drinking for a little while. So I did. And I seemed, I did that without a problem, really, because I had a focus, I think. My focus was the India trip, right? So I stopped drinking and I really started to enjoy how I felt, you know. Um, but all the time in the back of my mind, I was like, well, I'm doing this to prove I've not got a problem and I'm doing this to get fitter and I'm doing this because I'm going on a backpacking trip around India. Um, so I kind of, I've got that as a goal. But I also remember thinking, I wish I didn't have that as a goal because I'm really quite enjoying not drinking. Um, but I didn't really give it as much thought, I think, as I perhaps should have done. And so I did start drinking again around the Christmas time. But it, it didn't it was nowhere near as bad as it was before I gave up, but I, by the time I went to India in February, so this is a couple of months, it was, it was full on again, you know, I was, I was, um, so it taken like from December to February to get me to the stage where, you know, alcohol was, was being prioritized above my own well-being. Um, so then, so I did India. So I went backpacking. I went to some dry states. But when I was in the dry states, I always ensured I had some alcohol in my in my backpack. So, you know, that really should have led me to asking questions, some serious questions. But I didn't. Um, and then we got to 2020. And we all know what happened then. And I just went through 2020 in this state of extreme anxiety, as did very many of us, really. And my coping me mechanism at that time was, was drinking. So it became ingrained. There was always, always alcohol at the end of the day. And by the end of 2020, I thought, mm, I need to stop again. So mm. I, when I started the dry January. I thought, I'm just going to do dry January, see how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, the last time I drank was um, 31st of December, 2020. Wow. And so that would make you, how how long, what year? Is um, I don't even know. Is that two years? Yeah, I'm on my third year two now. Years. So I've done two full years. Yeah. And That's I'm, amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. I love it. I I really honestly it's the just the the best gift I've ever given to myself, my family, my friends, my dog, you know. Um yeah, it's it's incredible. And you know, I don't like to think of having regrets because we are where we are. We cope with life in however co we cope with life um, at the time, you know. And um, I think that like feeling shame can be a real negative experience. So I've you know I've done some readings of Brené Brown does a lot of work around shame, and you know I'm I just grateful. I'm really grateful for finding this life when I did really so yeah at 58 I stopped drinking <laughs> it's never too late right <laughs> it's never too late and I think that can be so inspiring to people who feel like it is too late and feel like you know they like you know they say like you can't teach an old dog new tricks yeah. and to, to see someone make a habit like such a significant habit lifestyle change at that stage in your journey it's just so inspiring yeah, I think, you know, it It doesn't matter what age you are. I think if, mm -hmm. you, if you really want it and you work hard at it, which I did, I think I, it became my new hobby. Yeah. <laughs> Learning about it, reading about it, self-development work, all of this, I just threw myself into it. 
um, and found I was really enjoying it and learning so much from other people and then enjoying giving back to people, you know? So, yeah, never too old. <laughs> you, can, you can always teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> I'm not describing myself as an old dog. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, I shouldn't have said that saying, actually. That was not my... <laughs> my intention at all by saying that. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> and so tell me about when you decided to quit drinking, how did you do it? Like, did you, were you part of any programs, any communities? What were like your key resources at that time? Um, initially for the first four days, I was, it was, I was alone doing it. Um, I had some, I had read couple of quit lit books I'd read the um Catherine Gray the unexpected joys of being sober I'd read um, I had Annie Grace's book um the um alcohol experiment no it's no it's this this naked mind sorry in the 30 days um experiment I hadn't even I didn't even know about that really um so I I then thought there must be something out there. I was doing Dry January, which is like a big movement, isn't it, in, in the UK? And I th- it might be sort of, I don't know if it's worldwide, Alex, mm-hmm. but certainly it's big in the UK. And so I was Googling around Dry January and saw that there was a Facebook group. And thought, oh, I'll join that. I didn't even know about Facebook groups at that point. Found it, saw there were like, I don't know, uh, 15, 20,000 people on it. That's incredible. Thought, that's a lot of people, um, but I'll join it anyway. And then started reading posts, and suddenly I didn't feel alone. Yeah. It's like, oh god, there are so many people out there, same as me, you know. And this was in- incredibly empowering, really, to to know that you know people need people, don't we, Alex? We need people, mm. you know, to survive and to thrive, and. When you feel alone, it's almost like when I was when I was a teenager and I'd I'd experienced that, you know, the, the childhood tra- the trauma, and you don't think that it's happened to anybody else, you, you know. So um, it's the same when I embarked on the 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 journey to become alcohol free. Really, it was so finding that group and then posting, and then there was a, one day during that January where a disagreement had happened um, and I'm not, I'm not very good with having um, disagreements and uh, I kind of turn them in on myself, you know, and, and the conflict had, had occurred and my way of dealing with conflict had been to switch it off to, to drink. And this happened during that January and I posted something in the group that I'd been down to the village and I'd bought a bottle of wine and I'd poured the glass and um, I really struggled with it. And I sat here thinking, I'm going to do it. And, you know, and I think, it, you know, just it was mid January or something. And then I thought, no, I'm not. I'm not. I thought, I know I'm going to pour this away and I'll post this on the group. And I did that and I just got hundreds of responses um and I thought oh my god that's that's just inspired people that's you know and people would say well done you know I don't know how you did that but that just shows how determined you are and it was like really boosted me and I thought I can go on here and that's the only moment where I've come really close to drinking alcohol during my whole journey was that time. And like I say, what turned it around for me was reaching out, was that connection. Mm -hmm. So I'm such an advocate of that for people. We don't have to do this alone, you know? Mm -hmm. There are people all around us. I know what your question was now. (laughs) Well, you answered it well. My question was, what did you do? Like, what were your strategies in those early days? And you know, yeah. what I love about what you shared in your story, something that actually stuck out to me is that you said for the first four days, you did it alone. And 
I could like hear parts of my own story in that because to someone who hasn't been on the sober journey, they won't understand how significant that is like to do four days of sobriety alone. But yeah. I did the same thing. I did my first seven days alone before I finally was like, I cannot do this alone. And I ended up joining my first Facebook group and joining my first program. And so I can so relate to that feeling of like being alone, thinking you can do it alone. And then just the power of reaching out and getting support from people that you don't even know around the world who have been through it or are going through it. It just, it changes everything. Just changes absolutely everything. That feeling of not being alone, that feeling of, you know, like you say, people you don't even know supporting you really cheering you on it's incredible um so that's what I did and then I joined a paid group I joined Simon Chappell's group for a while um but then I felt that I was making some really lovely friends and lovely connections some of whom I've from the states that I've met um but I wanted something more local to me as well, which is when I joined um, Be Sober, Alex and Lisa's yeah. group, uh, because I'd seen that they um, organise lots of local meetups, you know, um, in the UK, so all over the UK. So I thought, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna join that and see how I meet up. So I've ended up becoming an ambassador for them. Mm-hmm. Um, working a lot with with Alex and Lisa and organising all sorts of uh, in real life meetups, going up Snowdon, which is the highest mountain in in Wales. That was just an awesome day. Um, just and it almost like it was an analogy for me for sobriety because it was one of our party was struggling at times we would laugh and then she would struggle and then she would get scared and I would be like we're not going up that mountain without you you are coming with us you know and I'd grab her arm and and we'd go up there was nothing we weren't doing like risky there was no ropes and things you know we were, but we were walking up the highest mountain and you know we got her there to the top and I thought this is perfect, you know, and and she felt, you could see the sense of achievement she felt at the top. And I just loved that. So, yeah, we've done that. And then one of the first things I organised was a kayaking trip um, just on a lake. But uh, I, yeah, it just, it felt, there's such a sense of freedom that I've got from being alcohol free. Like, I'm not, there's been so many occasions where I think I don't even know who I am, but I quite like her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she, she's okay, Carolyn <laughs> is. She can do things. I've, I've, um, I've pitched te- a tent for the first time in my life. I'd never done that before. I went off for a weekend. Yeah, so that's that's just one of the things we have done in sobriety just getting together with a sober group of people is the power in that is incredible uh i run brunches i don't run the brunches i organize a brunch once a month for be sober and the last one at the end of january or they're on the last saturday of, of every month there a lady came and she had just got out of rehab and she said, I wasn't going to come. I was you know, nervous about coming, but I am so glad I did. And we were there for two hours and she was able to talk. She was able to share. And she, you know, she, she felt really positive about meeting people who are living locally to her, who, who can support her during this period of a life so yeah it's great love it so that's what I did and then I found mindful life practice (laughs) and I thought to myself I can never do yoga 
Because I'd done yoga once. I've been to a gym many years ago and a yoga class because I loved the idea of yoga. And the women there just were able to put themselves into positions that I had not a chance to do. And I felt um, intimidated, Mm -hmm. uh, inferior, insignificant, all of that, that stuff. And I thought, "Mm, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not going back to that. That's that stuff. Definitely not for me. That's not what I want out, out of um, exercise. So I left it. Never went back to it. And then met you on. I think you came to something with Alex and Lisa. Um, and I thought, I just immediately felt a connection with you and thought, I I need to to have a look at what Alex is doing and. Had a look and thought, oh, I'll just I'll try some of the free classes that you put out. So found myself doing that, found myself buying a yoga mat and blocks and a strap and thought, who is this person? But just really enjoyed it. And then I thought, well, I think I better join. <laughs> <laughs> I think I better join because I want the on demand and I want to be able to join classes. Uh, with people so yeah really enjoyed it and really enjoying it it's 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 changing my life you know all of this is changing my life and I'm so grateful for it it's just amazing and it's amazing to think how like it can go from like just meeting and connecting to like us meeting in Bali and practicing yoga together. And now I'm going to teach yoga on your retreat yeah. in September. Like, it's just amazing how life kind of happens and you cross paths with people and you don't know what a deep connection or how much they're going to impact your life. And it's, exactly. it's cool. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, have, having done the um, the 30 hours with you, I, I can now lead circles and... Yeah. I have discovered a really, a, a, a real fondness and a recognition of the power of circles. Mm-hmm. Um, so as, as a public servant working for 30 years, I, I have led groups um, of people and women's groups many years ago. And so having the opportunity to to learn about circles and to be able to lead circles for MLPC has really opened doors for me, um, not just professionally, but emotionally uh, in terms of my own self-development. And I've, so I'm studying them now. I'm studying, uh, there's a book that I bought called The Circle Way and I'm, I really want to know about the history and I really want to know more about the process and, you know, how, how you, how you lead a circle really well. Um, So yeah, so I'm doing circles for MLPC, as you know, and then I'm doing some circles for Be Sober as well. Yeah. It's almost like, coming home I've come home to to something that I was doing years and years ago it's amazing and if anyone who's listening wants to join a circle with Carolyn they are on Mondays Tuesdays is it Tuesday Tuesday at 5 5 p.m PM your time yeah yeah perfect amazing I for me that is I think it's midnight or 1 a.m Bali so it does not quite work for me (laughs) But I know I see a lot of positive feedback from you and Kelly's circle that you're co-hosting. So if that does work for anyone's timing, it's 5 p.m. in the UK, which makes it, I believe, 9 a.m. for people in... Oh, no, it's it's midday for people in Toronto, 9 a.m. for people on the West Coast. Yeah, you just know these times off the top of your head now, don't you, Alex? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, amazing. I'm loving them. So what's on your horizon for your future? Like now that your Bali retreat is booked, like, are you going to be offering any other retreats? Do you have any other programs coming up or offerings? How can people work with you? 
Um, I have become an accredited coach, mm -hmm. um, variety coach. So I, I did that with the uh, B Academy. So Alex and Sarah Williamson were the trainers on that. So I did that in October before I came to Bali and met you. So I've just started my business as a sobriety coach. Uh, mm -hmm. Early days, I want to combine it with working half time in my in my other role, in my paid role. Um, so, so it's early days, but I've just had my website done. So that's um, www.carolynclarkcoaching.com. So that's that. Um, I'm looking forward to doing the retreat. I, I will think about more retreats. Yeah. I think because I think I said to you, Alex, many moons ago, um, when we were talking about, we were doing some journaling, I think, and talking about what would be your dream job. And I wrote that down and and shared that that you know just leading retreats would mm -hmm. be a dream. I remember. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you know that that somebody has said when you a dream becomes a goal when you write it down, right? And it almost like it became a goal. And so I'm I'm delighted to to be doing that. I'm just in discussion with somebody in in Spain who's got a, a lovely place in mountainous area in Catalonia. So there could be the options of retreats. Amazing. Yeah. Well, if you need a yoga teacher, let me know. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Because I would love to go to Spain. Actually, Spain is one of those places. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I actually did go to Spain before I got sober. And it was a disaster of a trip. Like I was really, I was drinking a lot and I got into some really vulnerable situations and had some bad things happen to me while I was there. And it, in many years of hindsight, I see like, oh, it was because I was drinking so much that I, you know, put myself yeah. in these situations where these things happen. Not to say that it was my fault, but Anyway, the point is, I've always thought Spain is that place that I would really like to go redo as a sober person, yeah. and so, uh, so yeah, I'm I'm in. <laughs> yeah, it's I I totally get what you what you're saying, and, and for me, India is like that. I didn't, yeah, I was I was in my fifties. I didn't put myself in vulnerable situations, but I was probably hungover for the for the majority mm -hmm. of that month, you know, and so I I'd really like to revisit yeah. India and do that sober. You know, that's interesting that you say that because I'm looking at organizing a retreat to India. So we should wow. talk because yeah. <laughs> these are these are both of our locations. So that would be yeah. quite cool. Definitely, definitely. I mean, I traveled quite a bit in India and we did really long train journeys, like 16 hour train journeys and things like that. So it it was an amazing mm -hmm. journey. It's an incredible country. But imagine how incredible I would experience it completely sober. It just yeah. would be mind blowing, you know. So yeah, definitely on my list. We'll talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, it has been just so incredible hearing your story, getting to hear your journey, and just the way you've stepped into something that you dreamed about, and it's all just kind of coming together. It's really, it's really amazing and inspiring. And I think one key takeaway that I've had from from this episode is I just hear all of the ways that you've connected with people and held space for people and volunteered your time and all these different organizations. And, and as we were sharing before we even started the call, it's like not about how big your following is or whatever. It's just like genuine connections with people. And, and what I hear is that you've really done that. And so I think you are so deserving of, of everything that's coming your way now. Oh, thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. I'm just, I just, I, I wanted to share, I'm so excited about this. I don't know if you ever got, I, I remember asking you if you'd do a reference for me because I'd applied to volunteer at Russell Brand's festival and you have to give like referees. So I remember asking you if you'd mind that. Anyway, the, the couple of weeks back, I had a call from, from 
his team and they said we'd like you to volunteer for us and I was like wow oh. so I'm that's going amazing. to a festival as a volunteer and that's something I would never I mean I did two two voluntary roles in festivals last year I would just never would have dreamt of doing stuff like that before getting sober so it's, honestly it's like stepping out of a prison a prison a prison of my own making not my own fault my own making you know and just removing those shackles just opens up the world it's incredible I'm so grateful Amazing. and I want everyone to experience it everyone <laughs> No. Oh, amazing. I have one last question for you today, which is if you had any advice or encouragements to someone who is just thinking about starting their sober journey, what would it be? Yeah, I think it, it would be ultimately be, be kind to yourself, but write down your whys. Think about your whys. Think about them write them down, Start keep a journal, start journaling, build your toolbox, um, my toolbox. So I remember thinking, I don't even know what a toolbox is, but okay, people talk about it. I better just, uh, you know, just see what works for me. And so my toolbox just included all sorts, podcasts, quicklet, um, you know, treats, treats, a great advocate of treats. So if I, my, my initially, my goal was 30 days or 31 yeah. days, that's in January. So it's, it's almost like our brain saying forever to our brain is too much. But if we say, well, I'll just stay sober for this period of time, then we can review it at the end of that. So yeah, so just being, and that's, that's part of being kind to ourselves and things, isn't it? It's just, doing it in chunks um, and then yeah go from there really connect with people and give back because we give we get so much from giving back even once you've done your first mm -hmm. month there are many people who say to you how have you done that and when you share what yeah. you've done you get so much back from that as well so the sober community is just awesome. It's full of people who connect at such a deep level because we've all experienced the distress of, of thinking about ourselves in such a negative way yeah. because of how we've been drinking and blaming ourselves and you know this self-flagellation all of the real darkness that happens when you're on a a journey with you know with 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 alcohol in in in, in such a toxic way so i think that um yeah it's it you you get so much comfort and you can give so much comfort from just connecting with others i love it so i don't know if question but <laughs> the pa no the power of connection it truly I think that's like the theme of this episode the power of connection and sobriety and community and how yeah. being part of community and connecting with others and supporting each other is like the key the key ingredient yeah, yeah it it definitely is it definitely is yeah so oh. um yeah Amazing. Well, this was an awesome episode and it was so nice to connect with you and see you and share your story. And I just can't wait to see you in Bali very soon. I know my husband said last night, you know, it's about seven months. And I was like, oh my goodness. Amazing. Hey. And I've uh, contacted my cousin who may be coming over from Australia for the week after it. So we'll get to amazing. connect. Oh, awesome. So awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Have a Thank beautiful so rest of your day. Me and um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Hi, friend. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Sober Yoga Girl Podcast. This community wouldn't exist without you here, so thank you. It would be massively helpful if you could subscribe, leave a review, and share this podcast so it can reach more people. 
If we haven't met yet in real life, please come get your one week free trial of the Sober Girls Yoga membership and see what we're all about. Sending you love and light wherever you are in the world.